climate is pakistan's biggest challenge and climate is pakistan's biggest opportunity my job here is to convince you why uh it might sound odd given all the problems all the challenges that pakistan has that i come and say that climate is our biggest challenge but i do not say it lightly uh i do think it is bigger than all the challenges because it is existential uh because it is slow because it is non reversible because it is not political it is ecological climate is larger than us but climate is also our biggest opportunity and that is the part that i want to dwell on a little more uh, i want to start by raising three questions i promise not to answer any one of them they are questions that i hope you will take back home with you and think about and the first of those questions is about what does it mean to be global what does it mean to have these circles what does this mean to have these pictures around us we keep talking as if the global is a real concept global climate change globalization a uh, global moment global economy akuna matada everyone together what does it mean to live on a global planet the second question that i want you to think about as you think to me as you listen to me and as you listen to others is what does climate mean to pakistan should we really even be thinking about this or are there bigger better issues that we need to first think about and i hope you understand my answer to that already and the third question that i want you to think about is how can we make our climate our own and maybe this is my biggest biggest goal today how do we make climate a pakistani issue unfortunately we think about it we talk about it as if it is someone else's issue either because someone else has created it and we can get away by just pointing out they caused it they should clean it or as if this doesn't affect us this affect people who are who are much more much more uh, uh, rich or much more polluting and so on and so forth so those are the three questions that i want to spend my time on and i want to do this as quickly as possible i want to start by doing something silly um i know professors can do silly things i know deans can do silly things i wasn't sure if vice chancellors could do silly things uh, that's why i'm no longer a vice chancellor so i still want to do a silly thing i want to have you think do a little mind experiment with me imagine for a moment imagine for a moment you are not in islamabad imagine for a moment you are not in pakistan imagine for a moment you are not even on this planet Imagine you are on some other planet choose your planet there used to be 9 of them now they say they are 8 one of them is not doing very well you are on that planet and you are in a class and you've been given an assignment to write in two pages or less font times roman size 12 no footnotes two pages or less a country report on this thing called earth you look down at earth and you know like the un or the world bank has asked you to write a country report what sort of a country is this planet we we do that all the time is it a country like the us is it a country like pakistan is it a country like canada what sort of a country is the globe if the globe is a country i posit to you that you will find in the first section that you live on a very poor planet it is a poor country a billion people living on less than a dollar a day 2 billion people living on less than 2 and a half dollars a day it used to be 2 dollars a day but the dollar ain't what it used to be so by all measures you would say okay planet earth poor country but it's not just a poor country it's a divided country the famous champagne glass diagram for the human development report dr mehboob ul haq's invention 80% of the wealth of this planet is with 20% of its people and 80% of its people live on less than 20% of its 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 wealth don't feel too smug about it this is not about poor country rich country this is about poor people rich people for 20 years i lived in boston i worked in downtown boston 3 miles from where i worked was a place called roxbury 
the third world part of Boston. I moved then to Lahore. I lived and worked at Lums in defense. I lived in the first world part of Pakistan. Three miles from me was a place called Bhattava Chok, third world part of Pakistan. So this is not rich country, poor country, this is rich person, poor person. So you live in a poor country, country. you live in a divided country, but you also live on an insecure planet, on an insecure country. Not just because there's needless war, there's food insecurity and water insecurity and climate insecurity and human insecurity, but you live on an insecure planet. You will come to the conclusion that you not only live on an insecure planet, you live on a degraded planet. Its water is not worth drinking, its climate is changing, the seas are rising, its glaciers are melting. So by all those measures, you would write in your report, this is a degraded planet. You would come to the conclusion that the planet Earth is a badly governed planet. The way we run the planet, if we ran any country like that, all animals are equal, five are more equal than others. Even Pakistan starts looking like a better governed country than the country called Earth. You would find that you live on an unsafe planet. By the measures that the US State Department uses to say which country is worth traveling into and which not, the US travel advisory on the planet Earth would be to cash the first rocket ship out of here as soon as you can. Unfortunately, there's no place to go. Why am I doing this to nice people who want to learn about how to change the world? I want to make a point and only one point, and that point is that you and I are inhabitants of a third world planet. And yet we try to talk about it, think about it, do policy about it, as if we live on the planet Sweden. We don't. We live on the planet Pakistan, and that's part of the policy challenge in managing anything global. I want to bring this down to Pakistan in a minute, but I want to make the argument that not only do we live on a third world planet, we live in the age of adaptation. Because of the failure of the affluent of this world, not just the affluent countries, but you and me, because of our hot air, because of our false words, we have now condemned this planet to live in the age of adaptation, which means it is no longer a question of when climate change will happen, or what might happen when it happens. It is now, for many, many people, a question of what is happening now, and what is not being done now. That's the age of adaptation. It comes from three things. It comes from three failures, three tragedies. I'll be very quick about this. The first of those tragedies is the tragedy that you will see unfold, as will I, in the next 11, 12 days in Paris. It is a failure of negotiation. On the 11th of December, all of you and all of us will celebrate a great victory. Because Paris is condemned to succeed. It will not come up with a binding agreement. But we will convince ourselves we've done something because we all agreed not to do anything. We will write empty words. We will realize we've been negotiating for 25 years and celebrating false promises that countries have not met, all countries. The second is the failure of responsibility, the failure of vulnerability. You don't need to read this picture. The countries that do most of the emissions are the exact opposite of the countries that will suffer the greatest vulnerabilities. And that, I would posit, is a moral failure. The map you see is an important map because what it shows is where the greatest emissions are are the exact opposite of where the greatest vulnerabilities are, where the victim countries are, including Pakistan as a victim country. But I do not want to talk about victimhood. I want to talk about beauty. I want to talk about the grandness of nature. I want to talk about the power of ecosystems. I want to talk about the passions that we have lost. Because Pakistan is a beautiful country, as are all countries. But it is also a country that's defined by our climate. In some ways, all countries are defined by our climate, but not as much as Pakistan is. There are essentially two grand forces of nature 
that define your culture, that define your food, that even define the songs you sing, that defines what Heer and Ranja do, that defines what happens to Sassi when she is crossing the river. And those two forces are the forces of the Himalayas and the forces of the monsoon. The clouds come and they hit the Himalayas and they give us this rain which give us in this arid land a bounty that was not supposed to be. That has not just supported but created the culture that we live by. And we sometimes forget how important climate is to our being until it, it, it surprises us. It surprises us with rain, it surprises us with heat, it surprises us one way or the other. Here are a few ways in which I think Pakistan's future and the grand opportunities and challenges will happen. I'll be very quick about this. The first and most important of it is water. Till now when we talk about climate, we essentially talk about energy. Because we are essentially talking about this thing called mitigation, how to reduce carbon. We are looking at only one point on the periodic table, carbon. Essentially, all of climate policy is a policy of carbon management. And if carbon management is your goal, then essentially all of your policy is energy policy. That will remain important. But in the age of adaptation, when you're talking about impacts, what happens about it, think where in the periodic table the great impacts are. It is no longer only about, about carbon. Our most many of the great impacts of climate change are about water. It is water rising, sea level rise. It is water disappearing, drought. It is water melting, glaciers. It is water falling from the sky like no one's business, extreme events. So climate is now going to be, for countries like Pakistan, a water game. Just a little, 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 little um, a lesson in geography, if you will. If any of you believe that three-fourths of the planet is water, now, three-fourths of the planet is covered by water. And what that means is that all the water in the world is the little blue dot. All the water in the world is that little blue dot. Because it's a very thin layer that covers very large areas and most of it is not useful. So we need to understand water in a different way. But we would need to understand the impacts of water in a different way. And I think nature keeps trying to teach us this lesson and we don't learn. We are in the sixth consecutive years of floods. You've gotten so used to it, they don't even make news. Remember back to 2010? Uh, I was then living in the US. We were trying to raise interest, raise money, raise support for the floods and the victims and trying to explain to people in another continent what these floods meant to a country like Pakistan. And I came up with these three maps because you couldn't really explain to them what the magnitude of this was. So we took a map of the US and I plotted on it the area, the yellow squiggly line that covered the floods of Pakistan and put it in the same scale on top of the map of the US. It was up from the state of Maine down to the state of Florida. Same area if the area covered by the flood of 2010 was put on a map of Japan. It covers the entire country. Area of the map, uh, of, the, of the area covered by the floods, put it on a map of Europe. It covers from up in Denmark to down in Spain. There's a magnitude of this that could not be comprehended. And then I realized many of my Pakistani friends also did not comprehend. I did not fully comprehend the size and scale of what a water calamity means. So the first and most important challenge of climate is going to be water. And that is immediately going to be linked to the, climate, to the, to the uh, challenge of agriculture. Because you know, if you think about it, food is essentially nature's way of packaging water so that you can easily transport it and use it for other things. Not really, but somewhat. And you're going to get these agriculture. Research that we did with colleagues in, 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 in LUMS and with WWF Pakistan finds that in parts of Pakistan where we were doing this research on adaptation, the net loss to certain farmers because of climate change by 2025 on the main crops of, uh, of wheat and uh, rice, wheat, wheat, wheat and rice, 
is going to be up to 10% of productivity. That's large. But here's what's interesting, here's the opportunity. For farmers who are not adapting, if they were to adapt, the net gain could be up to 50% of productivity. Why does that gap come? Because our agricultural practices are fairly bad to begin with. Let me not dwell on that. The third of the great challenges that this means is the challenge of transportation. And we need to rethink the challenge of transportation. Our challenge of transportation is not the Prius. Our challenge of transportation is not the Prius. Our challenge of transportation are these guys. Our challenge of transportation is figuring out how many people are sitting in that rickshaw. Try to do a count. We won't be able to. And that is why maybe the metro is the solution. But maybe there's another type of technology we should also be thinking of. We need to think out of the box, but first identifying what our challenges of transportation are because they are not carbon related, they are also people related. The technology we need for, 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 for transportation is not just that it reduces carbon, it is technology that makes people's lives better. That ultimately is what the climate is about. Our challenges of buildings, but our buildings are not, our challenge is not just about smart buildings. Our challenge is about giving people decent livelihoods and a decent place to live. We act oddly. I don't know how many of you have this thing called a geezer. In the US, a geezer means an old man. But in Pakistan, a geezer means this tank of water. It's one of the most silliest things I've ever seen. You put fire under this tank of water, using a lot of money and gas to heat the water. When it gets hot, you send it in a pipe outside the house in the cold, so that it gets cool until it comes to your bathroom. Then you turn the tap on and you wait. It doesn't take great technology. It doesn't take great technology. You can bring the pipe inside. You can try to think about where to put the geyser. Right? I give you a very simple, silly example. Windows. We put a thin little window, keep it open, heat our room or cool our room with uh, electricity, and then sit with our guests and crib about how costly energy is while we are essentially wasting it because we didn't insulate the window. It's time to stop cribbing and start doing. The last and most important, but I won't dwell on it because we've gone through so many of these, is the issue of disasters. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, we have, like in many developing countries, we are not the only one, uh, we, have, we have equated climate with disasters. And those of us who work on climate are to blame for this. The biggest agency that works on climate change now in terms of money is the Disaster Management Authority. As if climate is going to be tackled after there is a disaster, we wait for the disaster to happen. The challenge of climate is not, to, not about what you do after the disaster happens. The challenge of climate is what to do so that the disaster does not happen. And that, to me, is the opportunity. That, to me, is the space where Pakistani understanding, Pakistani solutions, Pakistani technology for tackling with a Pakistani problem needs to come up. That, ladies and gentlemen, is not going to happen in Paris. That can happen only in Islamabad. Thank you.